Welcome to See You on the Other Side, where the world of the mysterious collides with the world of entertainment. A discussion of art, music, movies, spirituality, the weird, and self-discovery. And now, your hosts, musicians and entertainers who have their own weakness for the weird, Mike and Wendy from the band Sunspot. Welcome back, Mike. Thank you, Wendy. Welcome back yourself. You were out of town, too. I was, but you were in a very exciting paranormal location. I was. I was on the haunted ground of New Orleans, Louisiana, and uh, actually got to enjoy a bunch of the things in the city I hadn't seen before. And you had a lot more time than our last visit there. Yes, I did it almost a whole week to screw around and uh, roam around the area and really see a lot of the cool stuff of the city that I hadn't seen before and know that there is plenty more paranormal uh, outside of the French Quarter. Ooh. So what was your favorite sight to see or experience? Well, you know, the thing that I thought was going to be the biggest tourist trap was the Voodoo Museum. Oh, yeah. And um, I'd been to the different, you know, they have like Reverend Zombie's Voodoo Shop and there's everything's named after Marie Laveau, who was... Yeah. Uh, the voodoo queen in New Orleans. And I always think about when we went, uh, uh, the first time that we played in New Orleans, Wendy. So when you, me, and our friend Sherry were walking toward a voodoo shop and we ran into a guy and he's like, let me give you my mojo or your mojo. Remember? That's right. I do remember that. And so he gave us a little grigri. Um <laughs> A Gregory is a bag where you keep like your your good luck, your the focus of your voodoo, your mojo. And so, uh, I mean, he was just some street dude, but it was fun to talk to him. And then he gave us a little our little mojo balls. Yes, which is some kind of a seed yeah. that probably just was on the ground somewhere. <laughs> right. But it worked on me. And Who I knows? Still have, I still have that mojo ball. I think I might still have mine in my old violin case somewhere. Mine's in my, my bedside table well there you go that's an area where i keep i keep, that's ladies that's where i keep my mojo <laughs> secrets out but the voodoo museum i just thought was going to be lame and it's five bucks to go in and it ended up being a lot of really cool like iconography Ooh. so cool cool wood carvings cool symbols uh great pictures and art so I, for that alone i thought it was really interesting it wasn't cheesy um well it was a little bit cheesy but it, I thought just to enjoy the different carvings of all these different voodoo idols was really interesting. So that, that for me was, was a really nice surprise. Oh, very cool. And I did go on one cemetery pilgrimage. Ooh, which one did you go to? The St. Rock Cemetery. And I hadn't been there before. Like you usually go, uh, when you do the cemetery tours there, you go to St. Louis Cemetery number one. And that's the, the famous one. I think we have some pictures that we almost used the pictures there for the cover of our Cynical album, remember? Oh, was that the one where I used the video um, for Cemetery Highway? I think I did for one of the yeah. live videos. Yes, I think you did too. And, but also that's where Nicolas Cage is like a pyramid that he's going to be buried in. Uh, okay. So it's sweet. So like Nicolas Cage is a pyramid there. He's planning on, he's planning for that, huh? Yeah. Well, Nicolas Cage had one of like the haunted houses in New Orleans. He bought it. And I think it might be gone because he, um, because he had some tax issues not too long ago. Oops. Yeah, he didn't pay. And at least he didn't go to jail like Wesley Snipes. Oh, man. Brutal. Um, but no, Nicolas Cage has a, uh, a plot, which is really like a, huh. a pyramid tombstone in St. Louis Cemetery, number one. But okay, so St. Rock Cemetery, there is a chapel, the, Saint, the chapel to St. Rock. And, Saint Rock, and how, how perfect that you would visit St. Rock. St. Rock! It's Rock with an H. H. It's with an H. Oh, it's not okay. just St. Rock. Like St. Rock. It's with, you know, St. Rock with an H. I thought it was the patron saint of rock and roll. <laughs> Which would be totally sweet. But I thought it was pronounced St. Roche or Roche, like more French, mm. R-O-C-H. But then our Airbnb hostess said, oh yeah, St. Rock Cemetery. So she pronounced it like that and she's native. So I assumed that she was correct on there. So if I'm saying yeah. it completely wrong, okay. I apologize <laughs> to you uh, Creoles. But so in the chapel... St. Rock was the patron saint of like uncurable illnesses. So he's miraculous cures. Yeah. So, so in the chapel, there's this whole area where people put in prosthetics and so and masks and things. Yes. Where they, they hope that St. Rock will. Right. So there's this area and you can see it through a window. It was closed off because of water damage. 
but you can still see the area where people put their prosthetics as um, offerings to St. Rock so that he will pray to God to help them cure their horrible, you know, illnesses and have a miraculous cure. Okay. That was pretty fun. I think that was a, an interesting highlight. And it's appropriate, too, because today we're talking about all kinds of Catholic mythology. Indeed. Very appropriate for today. Yeah. Well, that's great. I'm glad you had fun. Thanks. Now, Wendy, what exciting paranormal activity did you do this weekend? Oh, uh, I went to the Ghosts on Film Festival in Chicago and got to see a, a variety of paranormal films about all kinds of terrifying places. And it was in uh, the loft of the Portage Theater, which is an old theater in Chicago. And apparently it has stories of its own, uh-huh. but I did not experience any of them, unfortunately. <laughs> and I got to see a lot of See You on the Other Side connections there. So Christopher St. Booth was interviewed live on Skype and he had a new film that was screened there, which I didn't actually get to see. I was busy running the See You on the Other Side booth, all the action there. And also got to see The Hidden Truth again, which is the the lacrosse smiley face killer one that we talked about. I think it was episode 47. Right on. And... Scott Marcus gave a presentation about that, which was great. And I'm trying to think, oh, there was a woman who did a past life regression on someone there live. Oh, awesome. <laughs> like a hypnosis past life regression. What was her past life? Did it, did it work? Did it, she, she was like, well, I used to be a, a French milkmaid. Yeah, she got a volunteer from the audience and he came up and... And he used to be a French milkmaid? He, not that, but she asked him how many past lives he'd had and he said six. And then she started going into each one. Uh, one of them was a Native American chief, and another one was a 17-year-old that was like a sailor who drowned. Oh, and uh, oh, apparently oh. this guy has a fear of water, so she kind of worked through that with him. But it was interesting. I'd never seen that before, so it's kind of cool to see the live thing happen. That does seem awesome. I've always wanted to do a past life regression, and there were tapes you used to be able to buy. Not buy, I mean, but so I just downloaded them on the internet, I, where it was you could hypnotize yourself into a past life regression, and you'd listen to the tapes and see what happened. But I tried listening to them one night, and I fell asleep. Uh, so <laughs> did I you dream about been, your past life? I don't even remember what I dreamed about. I woke up the next morning, and I was like, "Hey, I don't even remember my dreams." So I'm like, oh. "I could have had an amazing past life experience," and instead, uh, well, I had a good snooze. Well, her name was Mary Barrett, and she was a medium as well. So she talked about her experience as a medium. And just encouraged everybody to listen to their intuition and that type of thing. So overall, it was a fun event. Got me Mm kind of geared up to get back to Chicago for the annual convention again, which isn't until October. But it's always fun to meet other people that are interested in the paranormal. And, you know, that whole community is very fun. Just there's always great conversations to have there. <laughs> so Right. And if, if you guys are planning, anybody in the Midwest is planning on going to Chicago hauntings this year, um, you can see us, you can meet us in person at the See You on the Other Side booth. Please do. We will have uh, at the Chicago convention. We left a, uh, we get booths where we can so we can um, annoy people in public. <laughs> <laughs> and I like to bring lots of Christmas lights. Yeah. So we'll be decorate the, we'll the be, booth. The ones with the Christmas lights. Yeah, okay. one of the ones. <laughs> well, th- that sounds like it was a fun event. It was. And uh, I, can't, I can't wait to hit another paranormal event as soon as possible. Definitely. Well, this week on the show, it's a big anniversary weekend for Catholics. It is. It's huge. And this is always a weird one because th- a lot of these things happen in the you know 19th and 20th century. And when I was a kid, I was always like... Well, you know, I'm with you on the whole, I grew up Catholic, right? And we've talked about that on the show a thousand times. But, you know, you're with people on, a, on most things. You're like, well, they, they saw this stuff in biblical times, and, you know, the apostles saw this stuff with big JC walking on the water and stuff. But when people, like if someone came up to you, Wendy, and said, I just saw the Virgin Mary, she gave me a high five, and then whispered a secret in my ear, what would you be like? Well, of course, it would depend on who... <laughs> Right. <laughs> who, who this person is and how much I trust them and, uh, you know, hopefully have a good gauge of their sanity and trustworthiness. But I would probably be a little bit skeptical, I think. Yeah, I think I would be, too. And I think anybody like in the modern world. And I generally think of uh, the early 20th century as the modern world. 1917. I mean, there's people who were alive in 1917 that are still alive today. Wow. I mean, not. I think the oldest person just died like a couple weeks ago. So like... Nobody, I think, born after 1901. I think the last person who was born in the 19th century just died. Wow, okay. 
Well, that's a good run. Yeah, it is a good run. But I know that all of my grandparents were like 20 years old in 1917. So to okay. me, that doesn't seem like a really long time ago. Yeah, it's not a stretch. Part of the modern era, you know, and, and it's after the beginning of World War I, too. So it's already, we're already in the modern era. So when people start talking about really supernatural things, you always have that. We're like out of the age of myths. We, we're mm-hmm. into the, the modern age, uh, the, the age of science. Science and progress. So when these things happened in a small village in Fatima, Portugal, in the spring of 1917, well, the locals were just as skeptical, kind of, as we would be when we're talking about it. So what happens in, uh, starting, starting in spring of 1917, you get these three children, the three shepherd children, and uh, their names are uh, Lucia Santos, and she's got cousins Jacinta and Francisco Marto. Okay. And, this, I mean, this is a small village. This isn't like some kind of rockin' city or anything. And they say that they're seeing apparitions of an angel in the spring. And then May 13th, 1917, they say that they see the Virgin Mary. She comes to them and says that I will appear to you on the 13th day of every month for six months. Lucky 13. And that was almost exactly 100 years ago. Just over. Right. Just 100 years ago on Saturday. In fact, the Pope was in Fatima on Saturday. Oh, cool. And so he did a... um, They actually sainted the kids involved in it because... Uh, one girl lived up until like the 21st century. So we'll yeah. talk about her, Lucia. But the other two kids died a couple years later. Yeah, they didn't make it very long. It's sad. And this is what makes it sound oldie timey. They died of influenza. <sighs> right? And so to us, like, you know, like who dies of the flu? I said that and it, it like thundered out there. Do you hear that? Yeah, I was. <laughs> I just, that's why I turned around. I'm like, <laughs> look out the window and see what was going on okay and this is ridiculous and i know it doesn't make very good radio but what was funny was like then they died of influenza and we're on different sides of town here talking and so uh i hear it and wendy hears it and so i don't know what the time difference was but it's funny that we both heard the same thing a lightning but yet we're like 20 miles away. yeah that is odd well must have been right between us right it also means it's gonna rain so i'm glad i'm not running home i ran here Ooh. so i'm not running home nicely done yeah, thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> but what happens is, is so these kids start telling people about it, but the local authorities, are they think they're crazy. And in fact, they even locked them up. Oh, man. A provisional administrator briefly took the children into custody, believing the prophecies were politically motivated in opposition to the uh, secular first Portuguese republic established in 1910. So what happens is Portugal moves to having a non-religious government or taking government out of religion religion out of government sorry <laughs> here we're we're used to that because we're not supposed to have religion in our government yeah at least not on a federal level but that's a fairly modern thing in a lot of countries like we have no official state religion where even in england i think they still have the official the church of england is still the, the official religion so they were thinking at the time that it that, that these kids were just reacting and they're like well you've moved away from god or you know think about how i guess we call them bible thumpers here <laughs> You know, they're like, well, the the government's not paying attention to Jesus. And it'd be a funny thing for kids to do, though, don't you think? Yeah, <laughs> especially shepherd kids. Like, they should be thinking right. about, I guess, sheep. Yeah. They should be thinking about frolicking in the beautiful Portuguese mountains. Yeah. They shouldn't be worried about the government. That's adult stuff. Let's worry about adult stuff. But this goes on for six months. They say... That, you know, she appears to them every day for six months. And, and it's, she said that she would show them a miracle on October 13th, 1917. Okay. Okay. So that was the thing. October 13th, 1917. There's a large crowd. Really large. Yeah. I mean, thousands of people gathered uh, in attendance. And the three shepherd children are there. And the people said they saw something. It, it's called the miracle of the sun. And just the fact that there were... I've seen different accounts, like 10,000 to 30,000 people. Guys oh said 100. Gosh. Okay, so just the testament to the fact that, you know, these kids, what they said, people bought it, right? Yeah. They, well, the, the people were like, well, they it spread kids, like wildfire. You know, it's like when you read in the Inquirer that somebody has, like, somebody has a piece of toast with the Virgin Mary on it, you're like, oh, that's fine. You know, whatever. That's it's adorable. Yeah, you know, hey, it looks, that looks like the Blessed Virgin yeah. on a piece of toast. That's pretty great. But then if they said, the piece of toast was talking to me. And said that on October 13th, you should show up here. I'd be like, I'm not going there. <laughs> right. um, I'll watch the like, live forget. cast. 
Exactly. I'll click the Facebook live video if you bring your phone to the piece of toast <laughs> miracle. But the thing is, like, people went for it. I mean, it's a different time. The people are more religious. And these kids yeah. kept it up. Like, it wasn't just a piece of toast. They said that they saw these things. They said that the virgins started telling them secrets and had three secrets. Okay, that's where it gets fun. That's where it gets fun. Well, October 13th, 1917, after a period of rain, and here's what people are seeing. The dark clouds break and the sun appears as an opaque spinning disc in the sky. It was said to be significantly duller than normal and to cast multicolored lights across the landscape. The sun was then reported to have careened towards the earth before zigzagging back to its normal position. Witnesses reported that their previously wet clothes became suddenly and completely dry, as well as the wet and muddy ground that had been previously soaked because of the rain uh, had also been dry. Not all witnesses reported seeing the sun dance. Some people only saw the radiant colors, and other people saw nothing at all. And then somebody took a picture of the sun, and it doesn't look weird. But the thing is, is that there's a ton of people who say they saw the sun move around in weird ways. Yeah, and the brilliant colors and all the other anomalies from a typical day outside. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny. The church officially declared it a miracle in 1930. Wow. So they, they approved it. And they don't just approve anything. Well, they do. Th that's the thing. In order to saint somebody, so in order to say somebody's a saint, there's like different levels. And you have to have certain miracles happening around them. And there's like different levels of miracles. And uh, let me go into the uh, levels of miracles here because I thought this was interesting. Even the great Catholic theologian, Thomas Aquinas, comes the, the degree of miracles. All right. So the highest degree of miracles comprises those works wherein something is done by God that nature can never do. Oh, so like an earthquake wouldn't count or a volcano erupting or something like that. No, but the sun flying around extra. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's only something God can do. The second degree of miracles belongs to those whereby God does something that nature can do, but not in the same order. Thus, it is a work of nature that an animal can live, see, and walk, but that an animal being alive after being dead or see after being blind, walk after being lame, nature can't restore. So you can't, so since nature can't bring somebody back to life, that's the second, but God can bring somebody back to life. So Lazarus is an example of that. So that's the second degree of miracles, something that nature can do, but just in a weird order. And so the third degree is just when God does something cool, but nature <laughs> okay. can do it anyway. So let's say somebody is really sick and God cures them. Nature can cure people. You yeah. know, it does it all the time. You know, you get sick, you get better, but God helps out. So that's, a, that's, that's not much of a miracle, but it's still pretty cool yeah. when it happens. Okay. And I thought that was interesting. And the degree of miracles, they have to go in and they have different levels of investigation by the church. So they require different levels of proof. So for something like the miracle of the sun to have occurred, they had to interview hundreds of witnesses. And the witnesses had to all be kind of clear on the same thing for it to happen. Okay. So, and the fact that they investigate these things, where we'd be like, oh, this is crazy. Um, they're just like, okay, no, we're going to check this out. And apparitions they call them marian apparitions so the virgin mary appeared to a lot of people between like 1830 and 1950 yes so it even happened in wisconsin Woohoo! all right yeah wisconsin's the only place where they had a marian apparition in the united states and so they, they just approved it in like 2003 wow recently. And so the Bishop David Ricklin of the Diocese of Green Bay issued a decree with moral certainty that the events, apparition, and locutions given to a young Belgian immigrant woman were approved. Adele Brees claimed to have received three visits from the Virgin Mary in October of 1859 mm -hmm. in a place called Champion, Wisconsin. So that was a long, I mean, that was quite a while ago that it actually happened. Yes, but you think that if God's going to show up somewhere, or the Virgin Mary's going to show up somewhere, it's going to be champion Wisconsin. <laughs> but now the thing about these things is you're not required to believe in them, is what I think is interesting too. As a Catholic. As a Catholic. Okay. Like you're required to believe some things. You're required to believe that Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit are the, th the Trinity, the three in one. That's a mystery, known as a mystery. Yeah. Because like how, how can one being be three different things? How could Mary have a baby when she was a virgin? That's a mystery too. True. Of which, and if I was Joseph, her husband, I'd been like, that's a mystery we're going to be solving. <laughs> 
So you're required to believe that stuff, but you're not required to believe these things, but you're encouraged to believe them. Okay. And, you know, the funny thing about Catholicism is that it gets as, I don't know, as complex as humanly possible <laughs> to yeah. make things, that you, like the different rules and regulations, like, you know, um, you can do this, but you can't do that. You can do this, but you can't do that. You can believe this, or you, you can believe this if you want. You don't have to believe that if you don't. And uh, 2,000 years of history is part of what makes it so fun because these three secrets of Fatima, I mean, this really entered the public imagination. So there was two secrets that eventually get revealed in the 1940s. And who spills the beans? Well, Lucia eventually, because she, she refuses for a long time. She becomes a nun. And she refuses to tell anybody the secrets for like 20 years. Wow, that's impressive. And then she finally, uh, like, she becomes a nun and she her breaks. higher up. Well, she, she thinks that God, she thinks that God isn't letting her do it yet. Okay. She hasn't gotten the sign that it's okay to share. Right. And so, but her higher up, like the, the bishop or whatever above her was like, you got to, you got to tell me these secrets. Look, we've been waiting for like 24 years. And so it's 1941. And so this is when she starts spilling the beans. Okay. So the first secret, and this is how she wrote it in her memoir in 1941. Our lady showed us a great sea of fire, which seemed to be under the earth. Plunged in this fire were demons and souls in human form, like transparent burning embers, all blackened or burnished bronze, floating about in the conflagration, now raised into the air by the flames that issued from within themselves, together with great clouds of smoke, now falling back on every side like sparks in a huge fire, without weight or equilibrium, and amid shrieks and groans of pain and despair, which horrified us and made us tremble with fear. The demons could be distinguished by their terrifying and repulsive likeness to frightful and unknown animals, all black and transparent. This vision lasted but an instant. How can we ever be grateful enough to our kind Heavenly Mother, who had already prepared us by promising, in the first apparition, to take us to heaven? Otherwise, I think we would have died of fear and terror. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, that's a horrific image you just painted. And yeah. to think about children... <laughs> Witnessing right. something like that. That must have been so scary for those little kids. If that was a TV show, it'd definitely be rated like TV MA. Yeah, it would be like a video game nowadays. Right, it'd be inappropriate for kids, that vision of hell. So she showed them the first secret because Mary was saying to them that unless the world starts getting more religious, unless the world comes back to God. Get in shape. This, right, get in shape. This is where you're going to go. Oof. You're... You are, your souls will be pushed this way and that like sparks in a huge fire. <sighs> Shrieks nasty. and groans. So the first thing is a vision of hell. Now, they also said that Mary told them that the war, the Great War, would end within a year so that the World War I would end by 1918. That's encouraging. When she originally told them. So that was, that was good that she told them that. She also said another war would start before the end of the reign of Pope Pius the 11th okay and well this is interesting for the second secret because the thing is pope pius the 11th didn't quite make it to september of 1939 when world war ii started ah. with the invasion of poland so he didn't quite make it there but, but it was close yeah and also she's writing this in 1941 so the thing is and i and i hate to be like this but she already kind of knew what happened true <laughs> she already said it you know she, she it would have had more meaning if she had written it down or something like when yeah, don't she was young don't open until 1941 <laughs> right but here we're here we're 20 odd years later mm. and so she knows the history so this kind of yes it's a secret of hell and it's scary but it's <laughs> no great shakes now here's what i think is this secret is what i think is the most interesting and i'll tell you why so here's her second secret you have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. The war is going to an end, but if people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the pontificate of Pope Pius XI. 
When you see a night illuminated by an unknown light, know that this is a great sign given by you by God that he is about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the church and of the Holy Father. Okay? Now, there was northern lights visible all throughout Europe, a very famous northern lights in 1938. Oh. Okay, so, you know, there's a great light in the sky, night illumined by an unknown light. That sounds like northern lights over Europe. I mean, and not just Finland and stuff, like where you usually see the northern yeah. lights. You know, it's like, it's like seeing the northern lights in, you know, Florida or something. A major sighting. Yeah. Okay. To prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. Yeesh. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and she shall be converted, and a period of peace will be granted to the world. You know, I think this is interesting because, number one, Russia, 1917, the Bolsheviks, when the communists take over Russia, they don't just, uh, I mean, they, they killed the royal family and everything, Anastasia, the whole deal. But they also eliminate the Orthodox Church. Because the Bolsheviks are, you know, atheists. They're not big fans of God because, you know, the, the Orthodox Church was part of the whole Russian hierarchy that was keeping people down. Okay. The pe you know, pe people peasants and everything. So, but why she was thinking about Russia in 1941 so much, I find it interesting. Because, well, this kind of leads into when Pope John Paul II, he eventually does the consecration of Russia, which is a... Um, it's some religious ceremony kind of thing, but Pope jump, it's one of those complex, it's just, it's a religious ceremony. <laughs> okay. Um, he does it. And it's funny about the consecration of Russia because Pope John Paul II was a huge anti-communist. Ah. So he grows up in Poland during the era of the iron curtain and Russia's obviously the, all their satellite states, um, they're pretty hard on them. Like, we think Russia sucks now. Like, you know, everybody's like, Vladimir Putin's a bad guy. And yeah, no, I mean, he's obviously a tyrant in his own way. But, I mean, Joseph Stalin kills mil I mean, uh, millions of people. Yeah. Just boom. And Uncle Joe is a, a horrible guy. And, and so John Paul II really hates the communists. And I just think it's really interesting that this, this kind of thing, what she says in 1941, the second secret of Fatima is kind of like, you better watch out for Russia. Which, you know, like, why? Yeah, that seems odd, especially given that, well, the message was delivered so much earlier. In 1917. Yeah. Well, 1917 is also the year of the Russian Revolution. Mm. So, and this makes me think, you know, when the initial local magistrates or whatever thought that this was some kind of political thing that these kids were doing, it makes me think that Lucia is just the smartest girl in the class or whatever. <laughs> And she knows about the government. So she knows what's happening in the world. And just makes me think out loud. I mean, it might have really happened, which is perfectly cool and stuff, that she was just ahead of the game oh, on this wow. kind of stuff. Because I think it's funny that, you know, she talks about the consecration of Russia, my immaculate heart. And, you know, Pope John Paul II does do that. And we do have a period of peace. Russia, you know, the Soviet Union does break up. I mean, it, ha it doesn't happen until, you know, 1989. Yeah. But it does happen. The wall does fall. The Eastern Bloc is, you know, to what we have now. But it's just a really interesting thing. So re she writes this down, and then she writes down the third secret of Fatima. Uh... And that's what she won't tell anybody. So that's, she's, she says it cannot be opened until 1960. Well, it's good that she wrote it down because otherwise, right, take it to the grave, you know. And she gets really sick in 1943. Okay, that makes sense. So, okay, in uh, 1943, Lucia fell, falls extremely ill with influenza because it's what influenza's back, baby. It's the killer it's coming man. back with a vengeance. And so, her the bishop says, like, you better write this down <laughs> so that it's the recorded. bishop is just it's itching for that info. She says at the time she received the secret, she heard Mary say not to reveal it. 
But because it was in her vows that she had to obey her superior like it was an order from God. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's the Carmelite nun. That's the vow Ooh. that you have to, like, when you're your bishop or whatever, it's like he's getting a shot right from the big guy and you have to, you know, you got to do whatever he says. So he sends her a letter, says, you got to record this, write this down in case you, in case the influenza gets you. And so she writes it down on January 3rd, 1944. And then it's delivered to the bishop. He doesn't open it or whatever. And then in 1957, it's finally delivered to Rome. And it's funny. My mother talks about this because this is the kind of stuff they talk about in theology class in Catholic school. Uh Okay. They talked about Fatima because people start going to uh, Fatima now every year. This becomes a pilgrimage thing. Yeah. So this year, there were thousands of people going to see the Pope when he was sainting the kids. Right, so you know, thousands cool. of people come to see the Pope there, but um, they build a shrine there, and I mean, there's the Blue Army of Fatima, the Blue Army of Our Lady of Fatima, now mostly known as the World Apostolate of Fatima, is a public, international association of the Christian faithful that has the general purpose the promotion of the authentic teaching of the Roman Catholic Church and the strict adherence to the tenets of the gospel, and adherence to the message of Fatima. And the promotion of common good by spreading that message. There's 35 million people in this apostolate. Wow. It's founded in 1946 by a parish priest in Plainfield, New Jersey. And he, the, the priest gets really sick. And he prays specifically to Our Lady of Fatima that if she'll cure him, he'll spend the rest of his life spreading devotion to her. He got better. Ooh. And then... And then he started this organization okay. of spreading this message. So the interesting thing about these kids, no matter what they did, no matter what, they changed the world in a way. I mean, 35 million people I'll say. are part of this organization. Millions of people visit Fatima. And, you know, just this last Saturday, it's a, I mean, it's a huge, I say it's a huge party, but I've been to church. You know, it's not a huge party. I think it's a <laughs> huge gathering. I mean, it's a huge Jesus yeah. party. But so this is what's interesting. So this really captures the people's imagination. I remember my mother telling me about this when she first discussed this with me because we talked about this in our Sunday school, but we had Sunday school on Saturdays. And so she said it really scared her. Like, what would the Pope be, you know, why would Aww. the secret be kept until 1960? You know, she said she's yeah. a little girl and she hear about that. What would the secret? And then the rumor was that in 1960, the Pope opens up the letter and cries. Oh, gosh. Yeah, that would make kids scared. Yeah, that's going to terrify you as a kid. Or adults, even. Like, the rumor is <laughs> that the Pope, you know, reads the secret and starts crying. That's sad. So what can it be? And so she's like, I, I thought it was the end of the world. Yeah, you would think it'd be something really terrible. That's the vision of hellfire. And you can't, you know, you can be like, well, we're not forced to believe in this. But at the same time, the church is saying that this miracle really happened. Thousands of people saw the sun dance around in the sky. <laughs> like if I saw something like that, you know, and the sun came closer and dried like my wet clothes. Yeah, that's crazy. First, I mean, that'd be cool. Just be like, oh man, thank God these clothes were a mess. <laughs> it does sound pretty awesome too. The beautiful colors and everything. Yeah, the spinning wheel, like, yeah, the sun. But the sun does that kind of stuff. And I'm not um, doing some kind of religious peyote ceremony. Right. <laughs> you better believe I'm be crapping my pants. No, I, I mean, I, be- I believe. I would think it's, I mean, I'd be thinking UFO, of course. Ah, you know, I didn't think about, I didn't think about this as some kind of, so if the aliens wanted to kind of get their message across. Yeah. And the aliens come down and they appear to the they appear to the people in the form that they would trust the most. Right. Now why they wouldn't appear to Vladimir Lenin? I don't know. Yeah. Like you, I don't you know. think you think <laughs> when it, you change Russia around, the alien's gonna show up as the Virgin Mary to Lenin and gonna be like, Hey buddy, consecrate your country to the you know, to the Blessed Virgin, or you know what's gonna happen. Everybody's gonna be, you know, their soul's gonna be slithering this way and that. <laughs> right. So it's just funny that uh, I think with these, these Marian apparitions, I guess I didn't think about that before, that very, yes, absolutely, they could be aliens. And so I'm excited. I'm going to we'll have to explore that in a more, like, the Catholic Church is actually aliens. Yeah, or, I mean, explaining away something that, you know, it's, it's much nicer and neater to explain it as a miracle than it is to <laughs> think, oh, there's 
extraterrestrials coming to say hi. Okay, and so you just sent me the Fatima UFO hypothesis Mm -hmm. that investigative journalist Philip Coppins was saying that a series of manipulations created one of the most elaborate historical lies that from the backdrop of major political events. Huh. So these Marian apparitions really are us being manipulated by aliens. Well, it is is one theory, so. Yes. (laughs) And who else would be able to do that crazy stuff in the sky? It's either going to be God. Or it's going to be like a mass hypnosis. Yeah. <laughs> or it's going to be E.T. Nice. Okay. Or something else that we don't yet Have, know right. the significance right. or of. the fairies. Because <laughs> then the fairies do crazy stuff all the time. Right? You never know. Well, th- th- this captivates people's imagination so much. You know, because there's a secret. And up until the year 2000, when it was revealed, nobody knew what the secret was except for the Pope. And the Pope cried. Yeah. What kind of secret would make you cry? Think about that. Oh, I don't know. I mean, probably something about the world get, getting destroyed. Right? You shape up. Something horrible but, happening. Okay, so here's the thing. We get to 1981, May 2nd. This guy, he's an ex-Trappist monk. He's an Australian named Lawrence James Downey, and he's taking a plane in Dublin, Ireland. So the takeoff, they're gonna, supposed to go to Heathrow. Well, he ends up, he douses himself in gasoline goes into the cockpit and demands that the plane go to an airport in France. And when they get to this airport in France, he throws out this uh, nine-page statement. And part of the nine-page statement is he wants the third secret of uh, Fatima revealed. And he insisted that they publish the statement. That was the whole thing he was trying to get, right? In the Irish press, yeah. So, come on! Like... This guy hijacks a plane so we can learn the third secret wow. of Fatima. You, you figure the Vatican be like, you know what? We better just let well, people know about this. That was a long, you know, that, that was decades of teasing everybody. That's 40 years. It's, it's 40 years of scaring yeah. little Catholic right. schoolgirls and terrifying them. And so. But that guy took it into his own hands. Uh, yeah, he's just like pretty scary. I'm hijack a plane. And this is, this is when hijacking a plane, I mean, kind of the early 80s. That was a big terrorist thing, yeah. is hijacking planes. And it doesn't really happen too much anymore because obviously after 9-11, they kinda, there's no guns or you know, they really got to take shoes off. No place to hide anything. Tight security. Tight security. So the third secret is eventually revealed in 2000. And drum roll. <laughs> it's a bore. Oh. Yeah. So here kind of is the secret in her words. After the two parts, which I've already explained, at the left of Our Lady and a little above, we saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand, flashing. It gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire, but they died out in contact with the splendor that Our Lady radiated towards him from her right hand. Pointing to the earth with his right hand, the angel cries out in a loud voice, Penance! 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 And we saw in an immense light that is God, something similar to how people appear in a mirror when they pass in front of it, a bishop dressed in white. We had the impression that it was the Holy Father, the Pope. Other (laughs) bishops, priests, men and women, religious, going up a steep mountain, at the top of which there was a big cross of rough-hewn trunks as of cork tree with the bark. Before reaching there, the Holy Father passed through a big city, half in ruins and half trembling, with halting step, afflicted with pain and sorrow. He prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on his way. Having reached the top of the mountain, on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him, and in the same way, died one after another the other bishops, priests, men and women religious, and various lay people of different ranks and positions. Beneath the two arms of the cross, there were two angels each, with a crystal as presorium in his hand, in which they gathered up the blood of the martyrs and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God. First of all, let me check to see what an as presorium is. Sounds like a test tube or something. Well, it's, it's a thing they sprinkle holy water with. Oh. You ever okay. been to a wedding at a Catholic church or whatever? Sure. When they go down, um, they sprinkle holy water sometimes. Okay. And that's, that's to get the vampires out of there. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, a, that's how they get the vampires out of there. Every no, wedding should have that. <laughs> every wedding should have the part where the vampires got to run away. But so the third secret. Well, no wonder the Pope cried. That's a pretty horrible picture once again. And it's the idea that the Pope gets killed. 
Yeah. So, I mean, he cried because he thought, well, this might be me. Yeah. Maybe I'm going to be the one and everybody gets, you know, massacred. It's kind of cruel and ominous, too, that he's the one that has to read it. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, oh, man, did you really? <sighs> of course he cried because he's going he to die. But the thing is, the Pope didn't die. And in fact, they said that the secret actually predicted the assassination attempt on Pope John Paul II in 1980. Oh, interesting. So, and the guy that kind of wrote that up was uh, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who eventually became Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. Hey, so, so, yeah, so right. Cardinal, Cardinal Ratzinger, he's the guy who basically, you know, explained the third secret to the world. But this didn't satisfy a lot of people. There's lots of Catholics who think that the the actual third secret hasn't been revealed because they think, well, this secret is such a bore or whatever. Yeah, there's no possible way that could actually be it. Right. That is like, come on. And so they're saying that it's a conspiracy that the Vatican is keeping from us okay. the truth of what the third secret revealed because we can't handle it. So it's kind of like UFO disclosure. You can't handle the truth, Mike. You can't. You, right. You want the truth? You can't handle the truth, Catholics. So people say that, you know, it really does have to deal with uh, the apocalypse. And a lot of people suspected that it would be the anti-pope. Okay, so there's, there's this idea that it predicts a pope who will eventually lead the church and everybody else to ruin. You know, he'll be like the oh, antichrist. He'll, yeah. you know, he'll, he'll, be the, he'll be a bad pope. And the, uh. and, and the thing is, like, the church can survive bad popes, like popes throughout history. While popes might be infallible and stuff like that, they also, <laughs> you know, the popes had plenty of mistresses. I mean, we're talking about a lot. There was a time where there were three different popes, like, all fighting to be the pope in the Middle Ages. So, but nobody talk- really used the power for, well, that kind of evil. Like nobody drove the church into the ground. What they yeah. did was they just made it like, so they could do great stuff themselves. Like Selfish money, kinds of <laughs> power, sex, <laughs> yeah. money, you know, the, the normal human things that all humans want to do when they get a lot of power, they misuse it. It's, it's right. kind of what the popes have done over time. So, but you know, they're like, it's still going to predict the anti-pope. And then some guy, a lot of people don't like Pope Francis. You know, because Pope Francis is like the cool liberal pope. He's awesome. <laughs> you know, Pope Francis is he like, yeah. drives yeah. a Prius, right? Right. He drives a, the Pope Mobile is now a Prius. And that's, pro- that's why a lot of people hate him. Because he seems to be bringing the church over to one side of the culture war that they didn't occupy before. You know, he's like, you know what? If you're in a different religion, yeah, you can probably go to heaven. That's fine. You know, <laughs> you're gay. Yeah, God's not going to like send you right to hell. Just try to be still be a good person. Like... He's kind of the, the with it, like the 60s hip pope. Like, you, you know, I think about, you ever seen the movie Dogma? Yes. Okay. And so one of the best parts of that movie, besides Ben Affleck and Matt Damon talking about banishment from heaven as being sent to Milwaukee, which I thought was great. <laughs> oh, I was like, yeah, that hurts. I agree. That hurts. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, come on, guys. Um, these guys are from, New, like, Kevin Smith's from New Jersey, and he wrote that line. So, like, that doubly hurts. But my favorite part is they had, the, like, the Catholic Church is experimenting with this new buddy Jesus. And oh, it's, like, yeah. Jesus with a wink, and like, he's, yes. like, pointing at your buddy Jesus. And it's George <laughs> Carlin that does the introduction. And I just, I love that because that's what I, that's who I think about Pope Francis. He's, like, buddy Jesus. <laughs> like, it, it's cool, man. Like, hey, you know, man, God, just love each other. Yeah, God is going to forgive you, brother. Don't sweat it. <laughs> and... A lot of people don't like that about them. A lot of people like their Catholicism very hardline, very yeah, traditional, you know, old school. You know, in uh, the early 1960s, they had this thing called Vatican II. The sequel, it's like the Empire Strikes Back. It's better than the original. But the thing about Vatican II is that before then, like masses were pretty much half of it was in Latin. The priest was turned around like... And so they changed it up to make it a more friendly kind of mass where the priest could turn around and actually talk to you. Uh, they could have sermon. They would talk in English instead of Latin the whole time so you could know what you're saying. Wow, imagine that, understanding right. what they're saying. It's amazing. And there's some people that don't even like Vatican II. Wow. That they're, like that. they're like, no way, man. I want my mass to be high. I want it to be Latin. I want, there was just want the tradition. Yeah, there were kids at, our, at my high school that would, like, their parents went to the old mass because they didn't like the new mass or whatever. And they're like, well, that's not the real mass. And I'm like, well, we're all, you know, we're praying to the guy in the sky. Like, does it matter? Like, really? So there's people inside the tr- who don't like it. And so they think that, you know, Pope Francis is the anti-pope. And one of the reasons that we're not told the last secret of Fatima uh, is because Pope Francis is going to lead the church to ruin. 
Ah, kind of they think he's the bad pope. They think he's the bad pope. So the cool pope. No. They think that the cool pope is the bad pope. So who knows? Only only time will tell. Yeah, but I just think it's it's really interesting how this secret still captivates the imagination of people a hundred years after it happened. It's been a long time. I'll say. And these Marian apparitions and all this crazy stuff. And people are still talking about it. They just talked about it this week in the hundredth anniversary. They just sainted the kids. Lucia did not die in 1943. She lived to like 2006. Wow. I mean, yeah. Now that's she, a good run. Yeah. She, you know, I mean, she made it really long. She even said that we made it to the second secret. When all of a sudden the Soviet Union, uh, you know, disappeared and then Russia came back and yeah. de- they're working on democracy in there. And now there's an archbi- the Catholic Archbishop of Moscow. And the idea of the conversion of Russia... I mean, not everybody in Russia converted, obviously, but the Catholic Church is now allowed in Russia and everything. And so she, she said that the second secret was fulfilled, that, you know, uh, Mary is going to help save it's the world. Proud of us all. Yes, Mary's proud of us because we did um, consecrate Russia. Yeah. Huh. So that's kind of a happy ending to it. And I, I like to think of that as the, that is the happy ending of the, <laughs> the secrets of fun. Yeah. But it'll be exciting to see October 13th of this year. What kind of crowds gather to try to, you know, the 100th anniversary of the miracle, right? Yeah, I want to see the sun come back. <laughs> I want to see the sun come back. You know, there's a show on HBO that I don't think a lot of people watch, but I think it's really, when we talk about matters of faith and the way that people uh, take experiences like and find a way to make them religious, even uh, fantastical things happening, and they find a way to try to explain them. And it's in our human spirit to always explain these things in a religious way. The yeah. show's called the. Have you seen the Leftovers ever? No, I haven't seen it yet. Okay, the Leftovers. It, it was originally a book, and then one of the guys who used to work on Lost, Damon Lindelof, ended up developing it for TV. Mm. And um, he's learned his mistakes from Lost. Like they, <laughs> they haven't set up a whole bunch of mysteries that they never frickin' answer. <laughs> okay. But The Leftovers is, I think, a really good lesson. We talk about these kind of things that people see things, things happen in the world, and then we try to find a way to explain it. We try to find, a, you know, our spiritual nature, a human spiritual nature, trying to find a way to explain it. Hmm. And so whether it's a, the secrets of, you know, Fatima or these Marian apparitions, whether they happen in Portugal or they happen in Green Bay, go pack. Go pack. I think it's... A, <laughs> You know, obviously that's why God loves the Green Bay Packers, because the Virgin Mary, the only place she appeared in the U.S. is Green Bay. (laughs) So whatever these things, I think The Leftovers is just a really good uh, meditation on the nature of spirituality. And so that's why I hardly recommend it, even though the first season's kind of a drag, it gets much better. Okay. All right. Yeah, I was a little, you know, deterred by that whole... Depression thing. Yeah, I, I just... There's enough depressing stuff on TV already, you know. It really finds a lot more humor once you get through the uh, original. So I I recommend it. And really, what we're talking about today, um, there's no piece of pop culture right now that I think as well thinks about that kind of stuff or represents it as that show. Okay. So and have to add it to the list. Yes. And speaking of pop culture and speaking of... Uh, The kids that decided to tell the world about their brush with the Virgin Mary, Mm. um, the Sunspot song this week is, I think, a a positive, hopeful kind of track. It's not depressing. Yay. And so it's just a nice track. And this one, this one's off our first album. And we just thought it was appropriate because, you know, the original secret is about the end of the war and it's about, you know, trying to divert from catastrophe. And it's, it's the, whether, you know, whatever the kids did, um, they certainly affected millions of people and a lot of people in a positive way. And so we think this song embodies the same kind of spirit and it's called Change the World. It said our world is going to hell and soon we'll all be 
Thank you for listening to today's episode. You can find us online at othersidepodcast.com. Until next time, see you on the other side. Oh, gosh, I'm getting excited. You know why, Mike? Why is that? Because we have another Patreon hangout coming up. A Patreon hangout? I love those. Yeah, well, mark your calendar because it's going to be on May 25th at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Time. Oh, well, I will be there, obviously. All right, great. We want to thank our patrons for being the coolest people we know who subscribe to us on Patreon, especially Dr. Ned. Dr. Ned's at the level where we thank him in every single episode. Dr. Ned, you rock. Thanks, Ned. All of our patrons are very cool people interested in learning more about the paranormal, talking about pop culture, and having these fun conversations every single week. And without them, we couldn't do this kind of fun stuff. This is true. So if you're interested in becoming part of that sweet loving community, uh, and I believe that's the that's the last part of the third secret of Fatima <laughs> is to go to other side com slash donate. donate. I thought it was the end of the world. <laughs>